five, two minutes past five. Maybe we can wait for one or two minutes for other people coming. Uh, for those who are joining us uh, tonight, I want just to remember how it works. Uh, Jayad, um, professor in uh, Smirbon University of Technology in Melbourne, will uh, give his uh, presentation for about uh, one hour. Then we'll have we will have time for uh, questions or discussion. Um, if uh, during the presentation you have any comments or or question, you can do it in the chat area, in the public area, so that we can keep the, the, the question in mind during the, the talk. And um, if you want, you are also able to make discussion, um, but you have to raise your hand to ask your, your question if, if you need. But uh, I think the best way is to use the, um, the chat uh, area. So I would like to thank uh, Riyad for his presentation. It's the, the fifth presentation uh, this year uh, on webinars. Uh, on Monday, we have some technical troubles. So uh, Kent Harris was not able to give his um, presentation, and it has been postponed to next uh, week, end of next week, 10 of April, uh, same time uh, as uh, last Monday. Sorry about that, but uh, there were a big uh, technical problem on, on the platform. Well, uh, Riyad, are you ready to start? Yes, I am. Um, okay. can, you, can you hear me well? Fine, very very well, perfect. Okay, okay excellent. Thanks, okay. thanks, uh, Manuel, for that introduction. Um, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, yes, my name is Riyad Al Mahidi. I'm from Swinburne University of Technology in Melbourne, Australia, and I would like to share with you some of our experiences in field applications of FRP and bridges in FRP applications and bridges in Australia. Uh, as you are all well aware of the fact that our infrastructure is in real crisis, and this is a story that is told everywhere. It's not specific to any European or North American or, or, or third world uh, countries. It's all over the world. So as we know, uh, a, a, a very large percentage of or today's civil infrastructure is old. In fact, it is deteriorating, and the ability of many of these structures to sustain much of the modern load is becoming uh, a, a big challenge, and therefore there is a strong need to retrofit or even, in some cases, to reconstruct uh, our uh, infrastructure. Um, just to give you an idea here about what we face in Australia, I would like you to have a look at these four photos of the type of loading that our bridges are subjected to. So, for example, uh, if you look at up to 1926, uh, the maximum load that a bridge would experience would be this 15-ton traction engine. And uh, uh, many of these bridges that you see in that little old photo are still on the road network. And uh, we are now demanding many of these bridges to carry uh, much, much bigger, much bigger masses of, of, of truckloads. For example, now we have got the semi-trailer, 42 and a half tons. We have got the B-double of 62 and a half ton and the B triple of 90 tons, and that is increasing, and that's going to be increased, what we call now the road trains, which I will not show in this, but these are on special roads. We do allow what we call road trains. Um, so, uh, I'll jump in straight to the issue of strengthening. And when, when we want to strengthen such structures, Obviously, uh, the F R FRP systems have proven to be a very strong competitor to other traditional methods of uh, strengthening. 
as you will all know, I mean, you know, the FRP is lightweight, non-corrosive, high tensile strength. They come in different shapes and forms, and whether it's a sheet or whether it is a plate or even rods and bars, and they also have, the, all of them, they have got this uh, characteristic that they are lower in installation costs because of the fact that of their lightweight and uh, they do not require heavy lifting, heavy equipment. Um, I'm going to tell you the story here of the Westgate Bridge Project in Melbourne, Australia, which is considered to be the largest project in the world in terms of the amount of composites used in any one project to strengthen this bridge. So I'm going to tell you the story. Then I will go to the technical aspects of the type of technique that we have used in the strengthening of this bridge. So I'll give you the outline of the bridge, what we applied in this, the amount of FRP that we uh, that we used, and then we will move into some technical uh, aspects to show that what we have used in here to make efficient use of composites uh, in this in this bridge. Um, so the Westgate Bridge in Melbourne uh, actually connects two the two parts of the city. Uh, which is uh, which is considered uh, this bridge is considered a very very strategic bridge in Melbourne. Uh, strategic from the point of view, obviously, of traffic. The economy of the state actually depends highly on the uh, adequate performance of this bridge. Um, as you can see in this, the bridge actually consists of the central part, which is a cable state steel bridge which was strengthened, but not with FRP. Uh, and this bridge has got approach spans, 38 approach spans from the west and from the east. And these approach spans are, are uh, post-tension segmental construction box girders. It's these portions that have been strengthened with FRP. The steel component of the bridge was strengthened with something else. Uh, some additional plating was used, some propping was used to strengthen this part of the bridge. And so I will be focusing on the, uh, on the concrete parts of the bridge because FRP was used in the strengthening of these. Um, so what is the issue with this bridge? As you can see here in this cross section, actually there is nothing wrong with the bridge. What you see here is that the volume of traffic of this bridge has increased tremendously. So what the road authority decided to do, this bridge was designed, was designed as a four-lane bridge in each direction. Four-lane bridge with a, with a side or here, I mean with a lane on the side which is an emergency lane. What the road authority decided to do is to make this bridge a fully operational five-lane bridge. In other words, abandoning the the, uh, the the side lane or the emergency lane. So here we have from four-lane bridge in each direction to a five-lane bridge in each direction, meaning that you have got a huge increase in the load and also you have got uh, not just increase in the load, but also from the point of view of that the heavy, the part of the cantilever that's going to be now heavily loaded, meaning that you are going to have um, the cantilever carrying much higher loads. And number two, you have got huge torsional uh, twist, uh, torsional stresses developed in the box girder of this bridge. Now, if you look at, uh, to give you the project summary here in terms of how much FRP we used in this bridge, um, uh, uh, number one, as I said before, as a project summary, uh, the bridge was this, I mean, when it was first built in 1978, it was carrying 40,000 vehicles a day. Now it is carrying 160,000 freight and, and compute, commuter vehicles each day not only in the, in, the, in the number of vehicles, but also the mass, the limit, mass limits have increased. It's considered the largest bridge ever repaired with carbon fiber. 
in total about 40 kilometers of carbon fiber laminates of various grades and dimensions were applied to the structure along with 11,000 square meters of carbon fiber fabric. And this work was completed in December 2010. Um, okay, I would like to show you here uh, uh, the bridge dissected. Uh, it's like an exploded view of this uh, bridge. Uh, the span of each uh, of these approach spans is 78, so, sorry, 68 meters. Now, the bridge is, as I said, uh, post-tension segmental box girder bridge. Each component of these box girders, the length of it is about, uh, about uh, 4 meters, 3.8 meters, and the depth of it is about 4 meters as well, and the width of it is 14 meters, excluding the cantilevers. And the cantilevers here are also uh, precast elements, uh, and these are attached to the spine of the box girder by external post tensioning. So it's it, so literally the entire bridge was put together segment by segment, and the the cantilevers were attached to the spine, component by component, and then precast planks were placed on the top of the bridge, and then there was a cast in situ concrete to put it all together to make it an integral bridge. Um, okay, so that's the bridge. And um, as I said, what we needed here, because of the fact that we have increased the amount of load on it, we are getting what 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 the initial uh, what the initial uh, analysis uh, was has shown was that the bridge under this new combination of loads is going to be deficient in flexure, shear, and torsion. As far as flexure is concerned, what the bridge authority uh, and the original designers of the system, they decided to go for external post-tensioning, so that's what you see here. These are extensional. Uh, 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 these are um, uh, uh, post. Uh, these are cables that are used as an external post stationing system. You see here the black here on the web of the bridge. This is the red ones the, on the web of the bridge. These are carbon fiber, of course, and you have got the red things here are are, are is the epoxy here. So. Essentially, this is what um, the box girder would look like here. So we needed to strengthen the, the soffit of the box girder and the web of the box girder. Why? Because we are talking about here shear and torsion. This bottom strengthening here, lateral strengthening, is for torsional uh, effects. Now, obviously here, because we are using laminates, the laminates cannot be bent around the corner of the box girder, so the laminate will terminate here for the web, it will terminate here for the bottom flange, and then uh, some sort of a fabric layer or a number of fabric layers were applied around the corner to maintain the continuity of stresses and transfer of stresses from the web to the flange and from flange to the web. So that the this splice, that is how what was used in it was uh, simply fabrics in there. Um, okay, now the cantilevers, as you can see, this is a cross section here. This is the cantilever portion. Obviously, because of the heavier load here, the cantilever needed strengthening at the top of the cantilever segment here. Uh, using uh, the additional of RP and the thickness of the of RP that was used here. These are laminates that are specially made for this bridge, four millimeter thick laminates. So they are not uh, of the shelf type of laminates. They were specifically manufactured for this bridge. Not only would the, can, the, the, the cantilever itself require strengthening, but the root of that cantilever, which is this stub here that is transferring the load to the box girder, because of the thinness of the section here, it requires strengthening confinement because the, the level of stress in there in the concrete 
was in excess of the allowable strength of concrete, and that is why some sort of confinement con- uh, confinement of RP was used to increase the strength of the of that portion of the concrete in that portion. And the typical web strengthening layout, you simply put vertical laminates in the in the webs. Of course, as part of aspects of the construction here, you have got surface preparation, which is extremely essential. Uh, you can use all kinds of grit blasting to determine to uh, to to come up with a surface roughness of approximately between 0.5 to 1 millimeters. And water jetting was used to remove the dust and debris. Pull of strength uh, was uh, for for sacrificial of RP was used uh, using 50 millimeter dollies. And the tensile strength that was specified in this bridge should not be less than 2 MPA. Although ACI 440 specifies 1.5 MPA specifically to this bridge, we require 2 MPA as the minimum uh, pull of strength, tensile strength. Um, the application process, obviously, when you have got laminates in here, you have got the mix, you prepare the laminates, you clean the surface, then you do your mix, uh, two-part epoxy, and there are uh, different ways of applying the FRP through some sort of a, 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 a mold like this one that will ensure that you have got the uh, epoxy that is going to be on the surface of the FRP laminate to be in a kind of kind of a uh, uh, in a form that is going to give you a higher thickness in the middle of the laminate than, and than on the side. It's kind of a sloped type of of of, of uh, profile for the epoxy, and that way when you apply it to the surface of the concrete, it can and you press on it, it's it can ooze out from inwards to, to towards the outside, and therefore you eliminate as much of the bubbles and cavities as possible. Um, the uh, application here, as you can see, uh, this is using the bottom at uh, the bottom soffit of the box girder here, and, uh, and you know the number of workers required here is simply to put this in place. It's not because the material is heavy; no, it's a very lightweight, but it's simply because of the length of the laminate, and you needed some sort of a, um, um, some some sort of uh, a number of workers there to apply it to the soffit of the of the box girder. Um, these are these are some shots of the cantilever. You can see here in the cantilever part where you have got the top laminate. And you can see here at the root of the cantilever here the stub of the cantilever, the confinement that I spoke about before, confinement of the concrete in this area. Um, now so what were the issues in this bridge. I showed you the final product, but now to reach at that final product, a number of issues were faced in making decisions about what the best technology is in terms of the application of the FRP system. As you know, uh, the primary shortcomings of FRP is this issue of delamination. And this has been, uh, this has been researched by many, many researchers all over the world, and they have come up with design guidelines, whether it's in the Euro code, FIB uh, design guidelines, or ACI 440, or the Chinese and the Japanese uh, standards, and now we have got a, a new um, uh, Australian standards that are that's being developed for bridges. All of them, they uh, are you, they use the research outcomes um, of, uh, of, of uh, dealing with the early delamination of the FRP and how to prevent that. As you know, in Flexure, there are a number of scenarios how the FRP is going to be. It's a very rare that the FRP itself is going to break. Usually, your weakest thing is the concrete cover, as you can see in this classical type of failure that happens when you have got FRP here at the bottom. This is inflection. Um, 
So this is something, this depends on the um, number of, the amount of FRP that you are using, the concrete strain, concrete cover, and so on. So uh, all of these are going to decide whether you get end cover peeling like this, or what we call mid, mid span, uh, intermediate crack here, or combined shear and flexural cracks. Um, so the, the, these, these, these are things that happen, but these are the different types of the lamination modes in, in flexion. And if you look at uh, for shear strengthening, it's the same thing happens here when you have got, uh, it's also there is a delamination issue and it's usually free uh, plate and delamination. Uh, typically, this is what you will see in shear. If you have got these L-shaped stirrups, external stirrups that we put as part of a FRP strengthening of T-beam bridges, you get this kind of pull-off or that kind of pull-off at the top of the laminate. So this is always the case. This is what you get uh, when you have um, when when delamination occurs. When we were doing this shear strength, torsional strength design for the Westgate Bridge, we looked at ACI 440 uh, uh, for guidance. And ACI 440 requires that the effective strain limit in the carbon fiber laminates, it, it is to be calculated calculated in a certain, according to this certain procedure, and these are all based on the issue of delamination, provided that the upper limit is 0.4%. And this 0.4% is there to, uh, to maintain or to ensure that the crack width is not going to exceed a certain limit, because once the crack width exceeds a certain limit, you lose the aggregate interlock mechanism. So, uh, when we did the calculations uh, uh, for the demand of FRP force in the web and in the flange, what we found was that based on these equations for the Westgate Bridge and the material properties of the Westgate Bridge, we found that the maximum usable strain is 0.0018, in other words, 0.18%. And the limit according to ICI 440 is 0.4%. In fact, the limit of the FRP to cause fracture of the FRP itself is really about 1.5%. So the utilization here is less than it's about 15% of the total strength of the laminate. And it's less than 50% of the maximum allowable limit as per ACI 440. So clearly, this is a very poor utilization of the material. And that is where we started to look for some solutions for this problem, trying to uh, make the system more efficient. And so we looked to the, in the area of anchorage systems. And we know that FRP and anchor system have, have, have been successful in many flexural uh, applications. Um, the problem is that there are some research papers that describe uh, the behavior of FRP strengthening concrete structures with certain types of anchor systems, but there's really no design guideline. Um, it's uh, being developed as we, you know, as we speak now. I mean, it's, the design guidelines are being developed to look about the to look into the efficiency of of RP anchorage uh, systems. So the implementation here of of RP anchorage system, ACI 440 says talks about yes. As a designer, you are allowed to uh, use anchor systems, provided that you do due diligence in, in doing some experimental slash theoretical work to ensure that your anchor system is indeed going to uh, give you the desired uh, results. Um, so we started looking and we started to do a lot of experimentation to come up with an efficient anchor system for this, for the Westgate Bridge. Now, typically, what you when you look in the literature, 
a lot of people, some researchers have used on in applications, that is, they have used end uh, steel plating at the end here. Um, and also, for example, this is in flexure, in shear, uh, they would use some sort of anchors at the end of the laminates, like these. Okay. Um, if you look at other researchers and applications that for flexure, they use U-jackets. And the U-jackets can be vertical or inclined at 45 degrees. And in some situations, they use kind of a pre-stressing in the U-jacket by inserting some sort of sleeves at the bottom here. Um, if you look at other applications of anchorage systems, uh, some some researchers advocated the use of mechanical fasteners, or if not mechanical, I mean, in addition to mechanical fasteners, some researchers advocated the use of inserts. You cut into the concrete and you insert your laminate and your epoxy that with appropriate adhesive. Now. The problem with the Westgate, uh, and some researchers also uh, use the issue of fiber of RP anchors, uh, different types of, of RP anchors that mesh in with the, and this is more, more much more useful with uh, not with laminates, but with fabrics. And simply you insert like uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, some sort of a dowel uh, anchor here, of RP dowel anchor, and that meshes in, swages with the carbon fiber uh, sheets uh, on the top here. So this has proven also to be successful, particularly for the case of for the case of uh, fabrics, not not laminates. Any of these solutions, as far as the Westgate Bridge was concerned were rejected for the simple reason that you have got high, uh, very high forces of inter uh, in, 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 in internal uh, in post tensioning strands. So no drilling was allowed. Everything has to be on the surface. So no drilling was allowed according uh, to, to the uh, consultants. So everything here has to be external. So we started thinking about a simple, a simple uh, solution in the form of bidirectional fabric. And this is what you see. This is your laminate here. And it's really, the, the, the idea is very simple. So what we're saying here is that if we apply a bidirectional fabric here at the end, and the bidirectional fabric here is plus minus 45 degrees, what, you, what, we, what we are calling this patch anchor. And what this is going to do is that it is going to spread the load in the laminar to the adjacent concrete. So basically, you are increasing the bond area. Yeah, in principle, that is correct, but it needed to be proven. So we carried out an extensive amount of testing. And when I said we carried this out, we carried it out while the material was being ordered for the Westgate Bridge. So literally, we were working day and night to come up with this solution of the patch anchor that can be utilized in the, in the bridge and thus saving uh, a lot of material. So we used uh, uh, the uh, single lap shear test on uh, concrete blocks of quick concrete strength that is of a similar qualities to the concrete of the Westgate Bridge. And we carried out many, many of these tests um, with the bidirectional fabric and that bidirectional fabric, the width of it, the, the length and width of it as a variable. And also uh, we looked at number of uh, sheets that we used, the plus minus 45 degrees, whether one or two sheets would be sufficient and so on. So we covered that with many, many experiments to try to come up with a, an efficient uh, patch anchor solution. Um, the, and these are many photos of 
during the test. Obviously, here the preparation uh, in, the, in, the, in the laboratory for the patch anchors. Uh, the red here, this is your bi layer of bidirectional fabric at the bottom. And then you have the, the laminate adhesive, then the laminate, and on top of the laminate, we put another layer of bidirectional fabric. Um, okay, so what you see here is that the patch anchor under testing, this is the laminate being test pulled and in single lab shear setup. Uh, what you see here is that we use photogrammetry uh, and this photogrammetry, image correlation photogrammetry, to give a full field uh, strain profile of the carbon fiber composite here. Uh, we, we used strain gauges, uh, but all the, we relied heavily on photogrammetric measurements to determine the deformations and strain strains on the surface of the carbon fiber. Very successful technique. And these are the dots, these are the random, uh, these are the speckle pattern, random speckle pattern that's used on the surface. And uh, we strongly recommend that this technique be used as a non-contact measurement, measuring technique, quite efficient, quite accurate. Uh, in addition to that, we did a lot of adhesion testing uh, to ensure that the uh, type of concrete that we have and the application is of comparable quality to the, uh, what's being used, what was being used on the Westgate Bridge. And these are some failure mechanisms of the, uh, of the laminates for the control specimens and without the, without the bidirectional fabric. And this is with the bidirectional fabric. As you can see here is that the whole systems, the whole system works together. So when you have uh, the patch anchor debonding, it's really engaging a much bigger area of concrete in, in, in bond. And that will explain why we were getting a very good level of a failure alert. So just to give you an example here, in the control specimen where there was no patch anchor, the failure load was about 100 kilonewton, 99.6 kilonewton. The strain level was 0.25%. Remember the calculations that we did in one of the slides? It, it was saying maximum allowable is 0.18%. I mean, experimentally, that amounts to this because if you are going to apply a lot of reduction factors for a uh, problem for, 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 variations in the, that could occur in the concrete variations in the uh, experimental results. So that's about right, 0.25 when that gets reduced to 1.18%. When we started using the patch anchors, this is the level of strain that we were achieving in excess of the 0.4%, which is a maximum limit allowed by ACI 440. So it's quite successful and we were comfortable with these results and we, they were repeatable. Uh, we looked at the uh, strain distributions along the X. By the way, here, these strain distributions were measured with strain gauges as well as the image correlation photogrammetry. And the correlation was fantastic. And we are very comfortable now in using the image correlation photogrammetry rather than uh, and reducing the number of strain gauges that we put on our, on our, in our testing. Uh, again, some of the experimental results about the distribution uh, in the bidirectional fabric. You can see here in the lateral, in the, in the distance away from the laminates, uh, they are carrying very high stress and are dropping to the edge of the bidirectional fabric to nearly zero. So the bidirectional fabric is quite efficiently engaged in distributing the, the force, the lap force from the laminate to the adjacent concrete. Um, what we also found was uh, the influence of adhesive, the type of adhesive on the anchored strength. The higher, the better quality adhesive was, I mean, these were standard, uh, we call them adhesive A, B, C, D, E, F, for the laminate adhesive, for the saturant adhesive. These are, uh, you know, big companies uh, that produce, the standard companies that produce these adhesives, but we didn't want to give the, just put like a, 
gives uh, symbols for them, A, B, C, D, E, F, rather than giving the actual name of the product at this stage. So what we saw that the, for example, adhesive F here, which has got a much higher tensile strength than the other adhesives, really resulted in a much better uh, and more efficient type of anchorage, patch anchorage system in the increasing the utilization of the laminates. Um, and this has, in, in fact, one of them was, I mean, this, this adhesive has given us up to 6,000 micro strain, 0.6%, nearly 0.6% if you take the average of these two. So that's quite an efficient way of uh, improving the performance of these patch anchors is to use better quality adhesives. And you can see here with these adhesives, I mean, the entire patch is pulled off and it's pulling off concrete. And there is no failure in the adhesive itself. Concrete is your weakest layer, but over a much bigger area. And it is giving you the maximum utilization that is required according to the uh, ACI, uh, to ACI uh, guidelines. Uh, so the influence of adhesive on the anchor strength, I mean, what we saw was that the, that we can, you can get as much as two to three times uh, uh, strength enhancements um, when compared to the control specimens without the patch anchors, and the high strength adhesives prevented premature laminate slippage at a lower load. That happens usually at a lower load when you use low strength adhesives. We combine our uh, experimental work with extensive, very sophisticated finite element simulation, which took into account every palm, every part, every component of this composite with the epoxy, with the layers of the epoxy and the concrete. And the model here considered all the sources of material nonlinearity in concrete, crushing, cracking, nonlinear compression, compressive uh, compression behavior of concrete, and this co uh, concrete softening and con concrete uh, tension softening and so on. And the same thing with the adhesives and the bond slip between the caramel fiber and the uh, adhesive and the concrete. Um, and these were, and this is not a good slide here, I don't know when in the transformation to the PDF, but uh, the material model took all the material nonlinearities and also a fracture energy approach was used for the uh, cracking of uh, concrete. And based on that, a nonlinear bone slip model was developed which was when we used it, it really gave us a very good FEM correlation with the experimental results, as you can see in these, in these plots of the strain distribution, not only in the load slip, uh, load versus uh, strain in the FRP, but also the distribution along the length of the laminates and the failure mode. Um, this technique of improving the utilization of the laminates has become a standard technique now in Australia. And most of our bridges that are being strengthened, other than the Westgate Bridge, they are using this technique of, of the patch anchor at the end of the laminates. As you can see here, okay, this is one of the bridges, uh, highway bridges. These are the vertical laminates. These are the patch anchors. And the 4.4% utilization of laminate and uh, tensile strain were utilized in this bridge. Once again, if without the, these patch anchors at the end, the laminate level of strain, the or allowable strain, would not have been more than 0.15 or 0.18 percent. So you do save a lot in terms in the material, and you do, you make more efficient use of it when you provide a good anchorage system like the patch anchor, a very simple uh, technology, as you can see here in another bridge. 
is also used this technique. Um, another bridge as well. Um, so this has become kind of a standard way of improving the laminate uh, performance in uh, Australia in, in, in Australia throughout the states, and we are happy with that technology with that technique, and uh, it's also being incorporated in the new. AS5100, Australian Standard 5100, which is the bridge design code of Australia. Uh, more shots of that, closer, close, closer shot of the laminates and the bidirectional layer of fabric. And with that, I thank you for your attention and uh, I would be happy to answer any of your questions, if you have any questions. So, thank you. Do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Emmanuel. Very nice presentation, very interesting with uh, the um, application of the anchor in the shear strengthening. Well, we are waiting for any question you may have. Well, it seems that uh, none are, are coming. Uh, I was wondering, uh, Ria, the, if you have uh, the, on the part on the um, non um, the the um, the the device you used to get the, the strain profile, uh, were you able to compare this to the literature uh, model? Uh, there is a lot of local bond stress model uh, using this uh, technique in order to get the, the local high uh, shear stress in the adhesive. Did you try to compare your results with um, a variable yes. low in literature? Yes, yes, we have done that. In fact, there is a paper that is going to appear soon, uh, which is uh, which is based on the strain stress measurements and the development of bone stress uh, in the zones that of the anchorage zones, and to compare them with those available with those models that are available in the literature, and we found very good correlation with those, uh, you know, based on the. Uh, full field measurements of strain levels from which we develop the bond stress distributions and we did find that, that there was a good correlation with those models. Okay, so there is one question coming. Um, seems uh, appearing in the chat area. What about durability issue? I think maybe the question is about the, the, the FRP materials applied on uh, external bridges. Have you some, have you to 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 check about this issue. Uh, sorry, the durability you said? Yes, uh, the, the, the question is right in, in the public area, uh, chat public yes, area. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, the durability issues here, I mean, a lot of people have done a lot of work, including Emmanuel. Uh, they have done a lot of work on durability from the point of view of moisture, uh, cyclic temperature. Yes, I think it's moisture and temperature. Have you done some tests about yeah, your high temperature, like fire? Because this is another issue. I'm yeah, talking yeah, about environmental, uh, extreme environmental issues such as high temperature variations, as well as humidity. And and and, and what have been done on accelerated testing of uh, cyclic temperature, cyclic humidity. There was a reduction in the bone strength, and but what, the, what we found was the maximum reduction in bone strength was in the order of 15 percent, um, and, and this was like due to variations of temperature between 20 to 50 degrees and also relative humidity, very high relative humidity of 90 to 95 percent. Uh, so we have done some accelerated testing. Other people also have done 
uh, a lot of tests on these. And so really durability is, um, in my view, is, um, is, is well taken care of, taken care of uh, with this system. The important thing in the durability issue is the epoxy itself and the type of epoxy and the surface preparation of the concrete. Okay. Uh, is there any code in Australia for FRP strengthening? Yes, uh, it's being de- sorry, uh, it's being developed. Uh, AS fifty one hundred. Uh, I'm on the on that group. Uh, we have written design guidelines, and they are going to be normative. So this is going to be part of the code uh, for FRP strengthening. And yes, that is going should which should appear sometime this year. I expect it to appear between uh, July and August. Okay, very very interesting. I would be interesting in this issue also. And yeah. about uh, the the patch you shows, uh, will it be included in this uh, design? Is it well um, accepted by the the field engineer field, or is it only one thing you've done once on a bridge. Is it well yeah. accepted, this kind of uh, improving anchorage? I, I mentioning this because uh, the problem of uh, anchoring in the case of uh, shear is a real uh, big problem we have uh, in France in, in such kind of strengthening. And I uh, would be very interesting to know if uh, in Australia it would it's well accepted to improve the, the bonding with this kind of patch. It has become uh, very well accepted now. Many bridges, after the Westgate Bridge, many bridges were strengthened using this technique. And uh, in Melbourne, and Perth, and Brisbane, they have used it. But this is all based on the research papers that we have published and the design guidelines that we have produced after the work of the Westgate Bridge. So yes, it has become a, an accepted technique in Australia. Okay, well, um, is anybody has an additional question? It seems that your presentation was very clear. Uh, for all of you, uh, there will be a next uh, webinar. This webinar will be available for replay. You can send the link to any of, uh, of your colleagues. It's uh, free. Uh, the link will be available in about one, two hours. There is some time for uh, all this presentation record. And uh, I will, of course, be able to send this link and it will be in the IIFC newsletter also so and on the website also so if you or you can ask it by by email then uh, Riyad I would like to thank you again for this uh, very nice uh, and original presentation and well uh, see you next time in a con- IFC conference or elsewhere Thank you. Thank you, Manal. And thank you, everyone, for for joining us today. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. You are currently the only person in this conference.